Welcome to Things Musicians Don't Talk About. We're on a video, unless you're listening to this on audio, in which case we're not. But there is a video version that you could watch. Exactly. On the YouTube. We are on Hattie's bed. We are. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Ow. Sorry. Yesterday I was trying to cut through an ice cream tub <gasps> and it went through the other side onto my finger. But only a little bit. Shit. Anyway, graphic content out. Uh, we decided to do something a little bit different, mm -hmm. prompted, I think, by maybe our TikTok account primarily, yes. would you say? Yeah, and I think also the blog as well, yeah. at least for the OCD one. Um, the blog has been, yeah, there's a specific blog that I've written about my OCD experience, which has garnered a lot of... That's a good word. Thank you. <laughs> interest if that's the right word from not musicians but just kind of people generally struggling with OCD so I just thought maybe it would be a bit easier to come by like support for OCD if it was in a video rather than on a podcast but obviously it will be both um legend legend and that's the end absolutely so that's kind of why I thought maybe video would be an idea yeah this. um yeah so I, yeah wanted you to come and help me because I obviously could have done this alone but at the same time I love you yeah and like it's hard to keep your thoughts going straight yeah it's good to have some questions to prompt yeah and also from my perspective because I have the login details for the TikTok and the email and stuff so I occasionally see these people getting in touch and I'm like oh that is interesting I wonder what she would say yeah oh my so God. um your specific type of OCD that you talk about on mm. the accounts is one where you have uh is, is it the obsessions in particular that people are interested in uh i guess the obsessions are probably the thing that feel most like intense for people with this mm. type of ocd obviously there has to be compulsions because otherwise the obsessions wouldn't keep going mm. um but the obsessions are basically what ruin your life mm -hmm. so um shall i kind of just go yeah go for it what is so i have dealt for a very long time with a type of OCD that's known as like pure OCD which is a name that basically means purely obsessional so even though there are compulsions they're not as like overt as the ones you might think of in terms of like turning off and on light switches or like washing hands and things like that they're much more to do with like mental rumination or certain like more hidden things or like it's really hard to give an example but like maybe even blinking a certain amount of times or like things that people might not notice or are very easy to hide. So actually it can be a type of OCD that, at least for me, wasn't picked up when I was a child, even though I started, it started mm -hmm. when I was a kid, because actually if you just look at someone with this type of OCD, you probably wouldn't be able to tell anything was wrong. Because um, it's just because it's your very, thoughts? Yeah. Okay. It's a sort of like two, splitting your brain of two types of thinking and obsession and then like, trying to work it out and finding that this is a cycle that you just can't stop so I guess the type I deal with within that sub sub genre um is what I would term as like the fear of going crazy or like a fear of psychosis a fear of schizophrenia and it basically has in the past convinced me that not only this might happen but this is starting to happen to me mm -hmm. so I'm starting to become psychotic or I'm mm -hmm. starting to hear voices or or that like you know the probability of that happening is so I'm so I feel so sure that mm -hmm. that kind of thing is going to happen and what does it feel like in that moment of oh my mm -hmm. god it's starting it feels like my brain is really like like so loud to a point where I doubt whether it's actually thoughts or whether it's voices. Mm -hmm. And I guess this is where like it has been so hard to to like deal with it because it can feel like your your head is like so noisy. I'm sure you kind of get this from like anxiety and stuff. But I think it's that doubt and it's that like zooming into oh my gosh, like, I just felt a really kind of shouty thought. Does that mean I'm hearing voices? Like, I'm not sure. Did I really hear that? And then, like, 
out day to day, it could be, it got to the point where like, I would hear anything and if I couldn't see it, mm. I was like, this is in my head. Like, how do I know for sure that this siren exists? How do I know for sure that anything exists? It felt like everything was like the start of psychosis. And then where does it go mm -hmm. after that initial fear of it being psychosis or something like that? Yeah, so then I guess it goes into compulsions of like, did I really hear that? Can I find that sound? Like, can I recreate that sound in my head? Or like, so for example, if I heard a bang, I would often like be like, okay, I've heard that bang. And then my brain would be like, if you hear that bang again, that means you're going crazy. Mm -hmm. So then I would like recreate the bang in my head. Oh, it would be so stressful. And like, it would kind of like echo out. So it'd be like two minutes of these kind of like repetitive bangs, mm -hmm. obsessive thoughts in my head. And then the thoughts afterwards of like, that is such a crazy thing to have just happened to me. I must be going insane. Like, how do I reassure myself that I'm not? And then a big part of it is also distraction. Because if you've got all these different sounds and thoughts and like anxiety around you, the biggest thing you want to do is distract, which is another type of compulsion. Mm. So, you know, wearing my headphones obsessively, avoiding places where I could hear sounds, avoiding roads where there could be like mm. certain sounds. And, you know, uh, when it got really bad, it was just not going out, <laughs> just not going out, you know. Mm because everything would trigger it. Like even making food would trigger it because it would be like, like, I don't know if I forgot something to like, I, I don't know. It was just, it's just so much kind of mental That's what I was going to ask. Is it always sounds or is yeah. that an easy one because, or well, not easy, but like that's uh, easy for it to, to go Explain. down that path because you can't see sounds yeah so no it's not always sounds there's another type of it which was very much to do with my thinking and thinking I was you know getting delusional mm -hmm. so with a lot of people like it happened with my parents over one Christmas I just got these obsessions that they were out to get me mm -hmm. and I'd be like only schizophrenic people have these thoughts do I you know do I really think my parents are out to get me and it got mm -hmm. so bad that it was like I would look at someone in, in the street and my, my brain would go, they're going to kill you. And I'd be like, I've never heard this intrusive thought that's not related to psychosis. I've never heard that this is a thought I could have as an OCD person. Mm -hmm. So it would be then mentally reassuring, making lists of all the reasons I love someone, why, I would, why they wouldn't be out to get me. Mm -hmm. Then with my parents, it would be physical affection, like really trying to reassure them that like, actually, I do love you. And you know, this was one of the biggest obsessions because I just couldn't find anything online. Every time I would Google, which is another compulsion, but every time I would Google, like, you know, intrusive thoughts that someone's going to kill you or something, it would just come up with, like, you are, psych you know, psychosis, schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. um, and so I felt so trapped. I, I felt, on the one hand, like, I needed help for what could be schizophrenia. But on the other hand, I was like, if I tell anyone I'm in a mental hospital and I'm being treated maybe for the wrong thing, mm. who do I go to? So it ended up being going to the doctor and explaining the type of OCD thoughts that would like mm, kind of fit, but they wouldn't be totally true. Mm -hmm. And I think this is probably quite common with people with OCD. It's like, you're so scared that what you're thinking is true that you very rarely actually explain it how it is mm -hmm. and I guess that's part of why I want to do this now because it's only so I've only basically been fully recovered like a year and I can really now be honest about all of those thoughts whereas before it was like if you say this mm -hmm. you know someone's going to get the wrong gonna, end of the stick exactly and you're going to be then in the position that you feared you would be in exactly you would yeah. actually not necessarily have the psychosis but be treated for having psychosis and then you may mm -hmm. as well have it mm -hmm. so you're going into every situation with a gp or something trying to justify why you don't have that thing but why you still need help exactly okay yeah Ugh. sorry this is like a lot no no it's it's really yeah. fascinating because we've never actually talked about this yeah in detail and i guess that's kind of why i want to and it's it's where the shame comes in is because mm. I've had a lot of people tell me, and I agree, that like sometimes I don't want to overshare mm -hmm. or whatever. But there's never been anything to do with my mental health where I've been so sure that like, yes, overshare about this, please. Because it really can save people to know that 
this exists. I guess with other oversharing, like about depression or anxiety, there are so, there's almost too many resources on these things on the internet. So you mm. can find something you identify with. But in your case, there hasn't been something you've been able to find and be like, yeah, that's that's what I've got. Or if there has been, it's been like one thing. Mm -hmm. And this is why it's, yeah, as you say, it's so important. You're not oversharing, you're just trying to share mm. and tell other people, this this is what I've got, it's a thing and it's okay. Mm -hmm. Or it's not okay and, you know, you can get the help for this specific thing. Yeah, and I think getting the help was really shit because I you know moving into that I guess it was kind of four three or four years of trying to get help and it kind of getting better but then never quite feeling like I found someone that mm. believed me I had one therapist who specialized in OCD but because he'd never heard of this he didn't think it was OCD and he would tell me it's just anxiety and when someone's kind of saying it's just anxiety and your experience is like taking you to the edge of maybe even where you're feeling suicidal yeah like that, that really minimizes ter it. Yeah. terrible and then so it kind of I, it kind of got to the point in summer 2022 where I had like a mini relapse and I was like I'm going to try again I'm going to try with the NHS this mm -hmm. time and so I was put I, I self-referred on the improving access to psychological therapy thing for Lewisham mm -hmm. and I had a brilliant therapist through that who from the from the word go she like just took what I was saying and believed me and we worked on smaller exposures mm -hmm. we basically did what a thing called exposure response prevention which is a type of CBT cognitive behavioral therapy where you don't analyze your thoughts because analyzing thoughts is a type of compulsion for people with OCD. And presumably what you're kind of doing anyway. Exactly, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So this is where often it goes wrong in treating OCD is that sure. you end up being in this like loop of where like you're analysing your thoughts and doing all these like for and against things. Mm. So if you did that for like my fear, for example, what's the evidence I am going psychotic? That I, all of these things. All of these things. <laughs> it's like, what are the evidence against? Uh, statistically, I guess I'm not bad at... I don't know. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't work. So we did this thing called exposure response prevention where it was less about like analysing the thoughts and whether they're true or not and more about like challenging them and mm -hmm. seeing that I was safe even though I like yeah was really struggling. And I had a lot of fears around, this is really weird, but I had a lot of fears around lead poisoning because I heard that lead poisoning can make you go mad. So there were certain taps that I would just be scared to drink from and things like that in case the pipes were lead. And so in the beginning we would practice like, you know, just drinking water from somewhere or like if I'd touch something that I thought might have lead in it or whatever, mm. then, you know, staying with that. And another one was if I was near people on a bus, for example, who were talking to themselves, I would become very convinced that I was going to catch psychosis from them. Mm. So there was a kind of what we call mental contamination going on. And so part of that was actually staying in that situation, letting the anxiety build. And you want to get it so that your anxiety has reduced by 50%, I think. And that's your self measuring that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So when it's re resolved by 50% or gone down by 50%, then you can leave the situation. Mm -hmm. So I did that with, you know, mental contamination, certain places. I had certain places in London that I was like, oh my God, I'm going to go crazy here. Mm -hmm. Obviously, like any area with a mental hospital, like the Morsley Hospital up the road, did not like walking past there. Um, anything. To, so I watched a lot of programs, like documentaries about people with psychosis. Um, I watched some simulation videos of psycho. Mm -hmm. I think you've ever seen like a schizophrenia simulation video. No. Is it wait? Is this the the therapy or your? This is the therapy. <gasps> this is the therapy. Okay. And that was horrible because like. Some of these schizophren schizophrenia simulations do sound a bit like anxiety, so it was that was really hard to be like, I gotta watch this, and I just don't know if I'm psychotic, but I've just got to get through it. Mm. Uh, so I, oh, yeah. Sorry, were those things with your therapist present or were as homework by yourself? So we would do like the hardest one together, mm -hmm. and then, and often the hardest one would be just me reading my diary mm -hmm. to her. Mm -hmm. 
and like what I'd done because I didn't want to share That's this very with her. Vulnerable. Yeah. And then she would set me tasks. I remember one of the biggest ones that I was honestly scared for days to tell her about. Mm -hmm. um, we went to Cambridge like this time last year with my sisters and we went to Lush and there was a bath bomb that was in the shape of like Edvard Munch's The Scream. Okay. And I looked at that bath bomb and I just got all these like intrusive thoughts of screaming sounds. Wow. And, I, and like visions and like images and like, I was just like panic in the middle of Cambridge like, and for some reason, I could not tell her that. Like, mm. I felt like she was going to say, that's psychosis. Like, you need to go to the hospital. Mm. And I just never forget her listening to me and being like, it's all right. And I was like, you can tell me that you've, like, booked me in for an inpatient. Like, you can tell me that right now. And she was just like, it's fine. Thank you for telling me. Like, it's all right. And now I'm going to get you that bath bomb for Christmas. Oh, my God. <laughs> this is the thing, though. Then like, I'm going to watch you have a bath of it. People are still like, oh, my God, are you really scared of that? But, like... I feel like I have challenged and I still challenge yeah. them every day. I watch a lot of videos about schizophrenia because it's like, a, for me, it's like a muscle. Mm -hmm. If I don't keep challenging it, it's going to, it will back come back. Me. If I start avoiding, I know that's the start of the end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so the biggest one it built up to, it was like our second to last session. And these sessions last, I think there were 10. Mm -hmm. We've got 10 sessions on the NHS and most of them were over Zoom. And then our second to last session was in person. Mm -hmm. And we met at the Bethlehem Hospital. Whoa. We didn't actually meet at the hospital, but we met, so that's a mental hospital in South London. Yeah. So we met at the creepiest greasy spoon, like a 15 minute walk. Nice. And she was just sat there like with a cup of tea in this disgusting cafe. And I just, I remember just turning off and being like, Kirsty, no, was that her name? No, Lindsay, if I'm gonna go mad, it's today. <laughs> This cafe. It was like <laughs> raining. It was terrible. It was just like the worst day ever. I'd just come back from Christmas. It was literally, I think it was Blue Monday. It was a bad day. Well, if you survived that, you can yeah. survive anything. So we went up to the hospital. It's this like massive grounds and it has walks all around it. So she planned this whole like walk and stuff. Like, but as soon as I entered the gates, I just froze and I dissociated. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I feel like I'm going to go crazy here. Like, I can't tell you that enough. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm going to go crazy. Mm -hmm. But after like 20 minutes, we just like built up and up. And it, I went from like touching the wall of the hospital to like going in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And then there's a museum there. We went around the whole museum. They have like, like, they have quite a lot of graphic shit in there. It's a really good museum, by the way. On, in retrospect, yeah. <laughs> but I was so freaked out in there. We spent about half an hour in there and I was just sat like, <laughs> but it's one of those things where like in the moment, I genuinely thought I was going to, mm -hmm. something was going to happen. But now I can see that as like when my healing was mm -hmm. almost most fast tracked. That, because that was the biggest fear for me. Mm -hmm. Maybe actually the one step above would be like going into a ward. Mm. Still, that does slightly freak me out, but I feel like I don't that would freak out anyone. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's more at that level now where it's like, what is a normal freaky yeah. thing yeah. for most people and what is the disorder? Something you need to work through. Yeah. That sounds actually exhausting. I don't. I don't know how you did that alongside living a normal life. Yeah. Because, like, what... Say after the hospital visit, what... I, what were you feeling? Like, were you... Yeah. What did you do? I was really proud, actually. Yeah. I was really proud. Do you know what I was... That was this was a bad... This is what I do. I'm a voider. I'm an avoider. I'm a voider. <laughs> I'm a voider. I'm a void. <laughs> I'm an avoider. So I actually went and did an interview in no. Dalston after this hospital trip. Harriet. With Sophie Cower from the film Tar. And it was just... Like, I don't believe you. It's just so classic of just like me being like... Mm, That's fine. Yeah. Like separating out your professional life and your mental illness. It's like, no, this... If you, you know, and I was always like, if anyone had known like where I've just been, anyway, anyway. Yeah, yeah. But I feel like maybe maybe you felt that like in the past with your illness, I felt like all my treatment was like, I would I would go into therapy and I'd come out and then I'd just go about my normal life and I'd be like, if anyone had just like heard how shit this is, like if anyone could actually just see inside of it. But that is part of the craziness of going to therapy as an adult. 
which yeah. we'll talk about later. I'm it's sure. coming. Part it's two. coming. Part two. But um, that's amazing. Like, I know you said it's a muscle that you have to keep working, otherwise mm-hmm. it will, like... But that's, like... For me, that would be a full-time job. And mm. I'm so impressed... Thank you. That you've, like, that you're, you're having to do that all the time. Yeah. And I think that's the thing with it, where, like... I think that's why we stick together. You probably see if I post anything, all these OCD people will like yeah. like and message and like we're a community because we get it is a full time job. Yeah. And it's you know, I, I always forget where the resource is, but there's somewhere where the World Health Organization has listed it in the top ten most debilitating conditions. Because wow. it's de- it is debilitating. Like when someone said they have all these questionnaires of like how many times in the last two weeks have you felt this this and this with OCD every single one of those questions is like all day every day and I'm not joking you the only time you can get any relief when it's bad is literally if you're lucky to sleep when you're sleeping or when you're like blasting certain videos or for me when I had watched a video of someone else who's going through it too or like Mm. has been through it or presumably if you like get a blackout drunk or like you could understand why people then turn to other massive unhealthy or like dangerous Mm -hmm. distractions and one of my coping mechanisms in in school in school in college was to get in a relationship actually because he was a great listener and Mm -hmm. he really got it and Mm -hmm. he you know would do everything else for me and it sounds really abusive but when you're really ill and someone's offering to live your life for you and you're searching for that as well yeah like that that was kind of the only way I felt like I really get through it but and it's so misunderstood as well Uh even by people like the therapists like you said even by so-called experts it's misunderstood what would you say the most like top most common misconceptions are about it about this type or about like I'd say that it exists, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that, I think there are a few things actually, that we, that we are like stigmatizing people with schizophrenia and psychosis. Mm-hmm. And I think that was really tough for me because it was like, I love these people, I wanna love these people. And yet they are the scariest people on earth for me mm-hmm. right now, you know. That was really hard to reconcile. Um, the second thing I think is that like, hang on, let me think. What's the second thing? Maybe that's just the top thing is yeah. like, yeah, that we that we are terrified of them or that we don't want anything to do with them or that we hate them or, or whatever. People with schizophrenia. People with schizophrenia. Psychosis. And actually, yeah, I think this is where the internet's been great because uh, there are pe- there are YouTubers I found with the condition who like now I'd consider some of my favourite YouTubers and I've like really... You know, I love them so much that it's almost a case of like, and this is a big part of the healing, is I was off saying, if I did ever have a psychos- psychotic episode, mm-hmm. I would be I would be okay because they've gone through it too. And I think that's a massive part of the healing is like getting to that place where you're like, actually, like it could happen to me, it could happen to you, it could happen to mm-hmm. anyone. No one is like immune from that possibility. You know, and I think yeah. part of the compulsion is like looking at like how probable is it or like could this happen or seeking reassurance from people. But actually, like it could it could happen. Well, that it's going to like seep in through a weakness or, or like yeah. you've got it because you're lesser in some way. Yeah. And I think that's the biggest part of why it started at all is because of the stigma. Mm-hmm. If you think about it, like if schizophrenic people, sorry, people with schizophrenia were fully accepted into society would OCD be something that we would latch on to? Mm. It's like yeah. HIV. That's been a big obsession for people. Like, if HIV wasn't demonised in the way it has been, would people even develop an obsession mm. about getting it? So, yeah, I, I think kind of healing it is. it also comes with, like, healing the way that we all see people with severe mental, mental illnesses. Mm. Um, and, yeah, like, I do feel like now I've gone the other way of, like, and which I'm really happy about. I feel like I might not have even found out about those people. I might not have even gone there. Because even if you don't have OCD, like that is, for some people, quite a scary idea that people hear things in their head and, mm-hmm. and stuff. But now I'm just like, 
I want to find out more. Like, I find it really interesting. <laughs> but, yeah. Hmm. Any final questions? Love you. Well, no, I was going to say, is there anything else that you feel like I haven't asked that you wanted to get out there? Probably. Like, it's, the, it's the classic thing of, like, probably when it's over. But I guess that's the great part of maybe we have a comment section now. So mm. if anybody wants to ask a question, the yeah. comments, please. And then we'll probably just make another video <laughs> yeah 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 exactly but yeah thank you for like being here baby yeah, it, yeah it just also does feel like a long way or a long time ago now it, obviously parts of it still happen but it's very much part of the past yeah and that's probably very inspiring and like hopeful for people that are going through it right now to hear oh yeah i should probably have said that at the start but you did just now. okay yeah Kind of. It, re it You will actually forget about your OCD one day. You really will. And Just like you'll forget about your fucking heartbreak as well. Was that? Sorry, <coughs> did it me or you? No, no, everybody. Okay. All of us. Every 